Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Most of us are familiar with this old adage, but very few, I suspect, are aware that such ideas stem from the prehistoric period. Already at the dawn of human civilization, Mesopotamian sky watchers identified the planet Venus as the queen of heaven and Mars as the prototypical masculine heavenly power. Sumerian texts from over 4,000 years ago celebrate a sacred marriage between the planet Venus and her youthful paramour, Demutsi, much as many centuries later, Homer sang of an illicit sexual liaison between Aphrodite and Ares. Shakespeare himself was much enamored of such traditions, devoting his first major publication to the celebrated love affair between Venus and Adonis. Truth be told, the amorous adventures of Venus and Mars continue to resonate with us to this very day. How is it possible to explain the enduring appeal of these millennia-old traditions, not to mention their capacity to stir human emotion and inspire sublime works of art? Most important, perhaps, is what such traditions can tell us about the state of modern science. The celebrated love affair between Venus and Mars is a central theme of the case of the turquoise sun, which is essentially an extended monologue on ancient creation myths. For every culture on the planet, their most sacred traditions were those describing the circumstances of creation, commonly believed to have actually occurred at the time of beginning. To take but one example of hundreds that might be offered, the skiddy Pawnee of the North American Plains held that a sexual union between the planets Venus and Mars sparked creation. Rituals reenacting this momentous event formed a recurring theme in skiddy culture. For example, the drilling of fire was believed to commemorate Mars's conquest of Venus. The all-important question is how to explain the recurring thematic patterns of ancient myths such as Venus's love affair with Mars. And why would this particular sexual union be linked to creation? According to conventional scholarship, myths of creation were either invented whole cloth or derived by means of analogy and speculation. For Albert Heinrich, the Greek gods and myths are, quote, inevitably a construct of the Greek imagination, end of quote. Jan Asman, the world-renowned Egyptologist, defended a very similar position. Quote, the deities and their actions to whose reality human activity responds are a cultural creation, end of quote. The astronomer Ed Krupp concurred with these conjectures. Quote, we are pattern-seeking creatures, and we merge observation with belief to confer fabricated meaning on celestial events that have no physical relationship to conditions on Earth. It is our claim that the archaic myth of Venus's union with Mars commemorates extraordinary and decidedly catastrophic natural events as witnessed by ancient man the world over. The sexual union, or Hyrus Gamos, points unequivocally to a close conjunction between these two planets in close proximity to Earth, one in which the red planet appeared directly in front of the larger Venus, an impossibility in the present sky. This unique relationship, difficult to explain apart from a polar configuration of planets, is literally encoded in hundreds of mythological motifs around the globe. So far as I know, it was Dave Talbot who first proposed that creation myths described witnessed cataclysmic events involving the neighboring planets. This bold hypothesis, radical at the time, has only gained in credence during the past 50 years. The question asked by Talbot and myself is the following. How is it possible to explain the fact that cultures around the globe describe creation as a decidedly catastrophic natural event and in remarkably analogous terms? The only logical answer to this question is that ancient sky watchers were describing witnessed events, hence the similarity in their collective testimony. As I document in the case of the turquoise sun, ancient man was fixated on the events of creation. Rundle Clark summarized the Egyptian worldview as follows, quote, The creation of myths was founded on certain principles. These are strange and as yet partially understood. The most important elements seem to have been as follows. The basic principles of life, nature, and society were determined long ago before the establishment of kingship. This epic, Tep Zepi, the first time, stretched from the first stirring of the high god in the primeval waters to the settling of Horus upon the throne. 
All proper myths relate events or manifestations of this epoch. Anything whose existence or authority had to be justified or explained must be referred to the first time. This was true for natural phenomena, rituals, royal insignia, the plans of temples, magical or medical formula, the hieroglyphic system of writing, the calendar, the whole paraphernalia of civilization, end of quote. A similar ideology is evident in ancient Mesopotamia. There, too, the king's overriding concern in rebuilding temples was to, quote, restore the temples to their original condition without deviating an eyelash from the ancient original plan, end of quote. In this sense, strangely enough, Sumerian and Babylonian kings always had their eyes trained backwards on the singular events in Elo Tempore. As Stefan Maul pointed out, an obsession with the ordering of the cosmos at the time of creation governs early engineering programs. Quote, Our initial presumption regarding Akkadian temporal concepts, that the attention of Mesopotamian culture was directed towards the past and thus ultimately towards the origins of existence, is confirmed in royal architectural inscriptions, which often emphasize the intention of recreating conditions from the days of eternity. Implicit in this ideology is a Mesopotamian notion that all things in the cosmos, and this was by no means limited to natural objects, had a secure, inalterable place given to them by the gods during creation. End of quote. What was true of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia was true of all cultures around the globe. The supremely dramatic and awe-inspiring events associated with creation were considered to be exemplary in nature and normative for all times. Mercia Iliadi emphasized this point again and again as voluminous and vastly influential studies of comparative myth. Quote, For the man of traditional societies, everything significant that has ever happened took place in the beginning, in the time of the myths. It is impossible to exaggerate the importance of this obsession with beginnings, which in some is the obsession with the absolute beginning, the cosmogony. For a thing to be well done, it must be done as it was the first time. It was this fixation on the exemplary events at the time of beginning, presumably, that accounts for the fact that the ancient Greeks conceptualized marriage as a union between a bride representing Aphrodite Venus and a bridegroom representing Ares Mars, not unlike the prototypical sexual union celebrated in skiddy culture between Venus and Mars. Yet how are we to understand this single-minded obsession with creation, a collective and seemingly species-wide psychological trait, apart from reference to actual historical events? The word fixation is evidently quite apropos here, as there is a wealth of evidence that earthlings everywhere were so impressed and traumatized by the catastrophic events in question that they felt compelled to reenact them in a seemingly obsessive manner. Why this should be the case is a matter for psychologists to determine. Certainly there was a strong motivation to emulate the celestial gods' triumphant behavior and magnificent creations, to encode and instantiate the experience of mysterium tremendum, as it were. If the great gods in the sky had engaged in certain behaviors, human beings everywhere sought to record and emulate them. As a case in point, skiddy warriors, as they prepared for war, sought to channel the fiery furor or anger characteristic of the red planet during its conquest of Venus, believing this rendered them invincible and impervious to injury or death. Quote, As they are about to attack the enemy, they seek to become filled with the spirit of the war god. When so filled, they become ferocious or angry. They must at least pretend to be angry. Morning Star Mars is the war god, and they are to act as if filled with his spirit. End of quote. Virtually identical beliefs are to be found around the globe. Witness the Toba priests in South America who prayed to the red planet to, quote, endow the Toba warriors with fighting spirit, end of quote. So, too, the warriors of ancient Rome sought to emulate the furor or madness of the war god Mars. The renowned scholar Georges Dumazil noted of the Latin god that his epithet, Sicus, blind, characterized him as one who, quote, at a certain stage of furor, he abandons himself to his nature, destroying friend as well as foe, end of quote. 
Properly understood, the planetary history encoded in ancient myths heralds a revolution in our understanding of the solar system's recent history, not to mention the origins of human civilization and its most treasured institutions, religion, monumental architecture, drama, dance, music, sports, etc. As John Steele pointed out in a recent survey of scientific methodology, Astronomy itself is largely dependent on the use of past observations. Quote, Astronomy always has been and still is a science that relies on the use of past observations. Unlike most sciences, astronomy can never be truly experimental. Astronomers can only observe the astronomical phenomena that present themselves. Perhaps uniquely in the sciences, astronomers, therefore, are forced to rely upon empirical data collected by their predecessors. Yet the truth is that astronomers have turned a deaf ear to reports of planetary catastrophe in the ancient traditions and astronomical texts. To take a concrete example, Babylonian astronomical texts warned of the disastrous consequences associated with meteorites emanating from the planet Mars. Yet when meteorites on Earth were found to have the apparent signature of the Martian atmosphere, Astronomers originally denied the possibility that they could ever have escaped the red planet's gravity and made their way to Earth. Finally, confronted with the overwhelming hard evidence presented by the hundreds of Martian meteorites found on Earth, astronomers were forced to revise their estimates of what was possible. What, then, is the conclusion we should draw from this recent history? Do we give the ancient sky watchers their just due and acknowledge that modern astronomy does not possess all the answers? Most important, perhaps, is the following question. Is the presence of Mars rocks on Earth most logically explained by the former close proximity of Mars and Earth, as maintained by Talbot and myself, or by two planets orbiting peacefully on their present orbits over 100 million miles distant from each other? In the final analysis, the question boils down to this. What is our most trustworthy guide for reconstructing the history of the solar system? A computer simulation at NASA, or the eyewitness accounts and memories of our forebears. The same logic applies to dozens of other anomalies presented by the Red Planet. Astronomers assure us that the Martian surface provides compelling evidence that vast quantities of water, oceans even, formerly existed on that planet. Is the current paucity of water on the Red Planet then best explained by uniformitarian processes? or by the colossal catastrophes experienced by Mars as it was ejected from its former orbit between Venus and Earth. Recall here that ancient traditions describe Mars as being involved in a catastrophic tug-of-war between Venus and Earth in which the diminutive planet suffered dramatic metamorphoses in its appearance and apparent size, alternately appearing as a prodigious bolide looming large in the northern circumpolant heavens and as a dwarf-like object close to Venus. Certainly it is hard to imagine that Mars would have emerged unscathed from this battle of the gods. Similar questions surround Mars's rubble-strewn surface, missing atmosphere, and radical dichotomy between its northern and southern hemisphere. Flat lowlands characterize the northern hemisphere, while the southern hemisphere is distinguished by numerous volcanoes and uplifted surficial features. As Wall Thornhill pointed out, it appears for all the world like some catastrophic process excavated miles of rock from Mars's northern hemisphere, leaving the red planet with a flat top haircut in the process. The northern hemisphere is but 32 kilometers in thickness, while the southern is 58 kilometers. To me, it is almost inconceivable that astronomers, when confronted with Mars's tortured geology, do not see evidence of catastrophism on a massive scale. Alas, their models don't allow for it, so they effectively remain blind to the evidence staring them right in the face. Granted that an astronomer can be found who is willing to entertain the evidence for wholesale catastrophic forces on Mars, it is to be expected that he or she will seek to push these events back hundreds of millions of years, if not to the origins of the solar system itself. Hence the various attempts to explain Mars's dichotomy by massive impacts to one hemisphere or the other near the time of the solar system's origin. Yet the evidence on the ground is not to be explained away. What makes more sense? 
to view Mars's rubble-strewn terrain, rampant scarring, radical dichotomy, and absence of oceans and atmosphere as remnants of events from the period of the origin of the solar system, or from the vantage point of the collective testimony provided by human sky watchers around the globe who described Mars as participating in apocalyptic catastrophes and subject to a myriad of external stresses. For us, the answer is obvious, and we remain confident that future Space Age findings will bear this out. In summary, there have been a handful of epical discoveries that revolutionized humankind's conception of ancient history. The discovery of dinosaur bones in Europe during the 17th century was so sensational that they were initially denied outright, but eventually were acknowledged to reveal worlds hitherto unsuspected and almost beyond comprehension. Heinrich Schliemann's discovery in Troy in 1873, likewise, demonstrated that Homer's poems were not the stuff of fiction. When all is said and done, and the evidence on the respective planets is subjected to a fair and systematic analysis, I remain convinced that Talbot's discovery of the polar configuration, together with Thornhill's demonstration of the electrical origins of the manifold surface structures on Mars and Venus, will take their place among the greatest scientific discoveries of this or any other age. It is only fitting that Wall be allowed to have the last word. Quote, Mars and Venus hold the key to the recent history of the solar system. End of quote. Truer words were never spoken. Thank you.